All right, so let's talk a little bit about respiratory drugs. So we'll talk about some of the common drugs we use, like the ABCs of respiratory agents, and then talk about these allergic processes as well. So we've got a 14-year-old who comes in with severe shortness of breath, has a history of asthma, no relief with home meds, something we commonly run into. They've had two or three of their NEBs at home. EMS went ahead and gave an albuterol ipatropium NEB times two, so now she's had roughly five nebulizers. Vital signs, 120, 30, 93% of room air. She's got wheezing, accessory muscle use. Her mental status is good. So what are you going to do now? What can we treat her with? She's had five nebs. Epinephrine, yes, I love it. This patient is a great candidate for IM epinephrine. If they've had three, four, five albuterol treatments or leave albuterol treatments, and they're not better, let's go to something else. Epi is a great option, especially in a young person. Magnesium is another good option. We're getting up to things like Heliox, then we're having a bad day. But definitely think about the role of epinephrine. Think about the role of magnesium. We'll talk about those in more detail in a few moments. Probably looking at most of the recent literature, we should start thinking about giving inhaled corticosteroids in the ED as well. Not just systemic, but inhaled. Because inhaled corticosteroids are going to have a faster onset because they're right there at the site of where they need to work. And it probably should be using more inhaled corticosteroids. And definitely think about discharge. If patients aren't on inhaled corticosteroids, we should consider that probably more than systemic corticosteroids because of less side effects and more effective in the lung tissue. So asthma. Asthma is a chronic obstructive reactive airway disease. Most people with asthma, it's immunological. They're exposed to something that triggers this immune response. They release histamine. They get mucus production. They get airway narrowing, and they have the respiratory distress. It's immunological. Some people, it may be cold air, it may be just a virus. Viral exposures are a big trigger of asthma exacerbations as well, but most we usually think about immunological. Our COPD patients, like our emphysema patients, we used to refer to as our pink puffers. Most patients with COPD have a chronic history of smoking. We will see this occasionally in people that have no history of smoking. It's either from secondary exposure or from some type of occupational exposure. Your classic emphysema patient has that overdistension of the alveoli. They had that barrel chest appearance. Think about how elastic our lungs are, how much flexibility our lungs have. They're constantly inflating and deflating. But with emphysema, they lose a lot of that elasticity. They lose a lot of their compliance. And they tend to have that overdistension of the alveoli. They have a lot of gas trapping. Where your chronic bronchitis patient or your blue bloaters, these are the patients that usually have that chronic cough. These are the patients that usually have the risk for having hypercapnia. It's a small group of these patients that usually have high CO2 levels. They knock out their CO2 drive, and it's this small group of these patients, about 20-25% of your chronic bronchitis patients that have that high CO2, so they rely upon their hypoxic drive. Those are the people we have to be concerned with. If we give them too much O2, we might knock out their respiratory drive. We're not going to deny them oxygen, but they have that risk. But with your chronic bronchitis patient, they have that thick sputum. So, kind of give you a table comparison here, looking at these patients. Kind of helps differentiate one versus the other. Initially, for most of us, our treatment's the same, whether it's asthma or COPD, that's emphysema or bronchitis. But definitely think about the pathophysiology is a little different, and we know that certain medications may work better for one versus the other. Croup. Viral infection, we usually think about with our pediatric patients. Occasionally, we'll see adults with croup-like presentation. Usually, it's viral, adenovirus, rhinovirus, sometimes it's RSV. But they get that inflammation, that narrowing of the airways, and they have that chronic strider that we'll hear, and they have that barky sill cough. Those are things that come along with this croup patient. What's worse, strider at rest or strider with exertion? The strider at rest. That person who's laying in the bed and strider is doing nothing, that's the kid I'm really concerned about versus the kid who's running around the room and strider us. If I ran around this room a couple of times, I'd probably strider us as well. I can make myself sound that way. It's a strider at rest. 
that croupy, barky seal cough. That's your croup patient. Usually kids, but it could be in adults as well. So we talk about these agents are anticholinergics or anti-muscarinics. These usually are some of our first line agents for treating COPD. If you look at the gold guidelines, they usually recommend starting with an anticholinergic to try to help with some of that mucus production. We do know these anticholinergics also have some bronchial relaxation properties. So this is your ipotropium. There's some long acting antimuscarinics out there that we'll sometimes see people taking for maintenance but it's these short-acting drugs that are very effective. Most of these are only FDA approved for COPD. Some have approval or some have indications and are used off-label for asthma, but typically your first-line agent for a COPD is gonna be an anti-muscarinic. These do have some synergistic effects with our beta agonists, so we get a little bit more beta effect, we get more bronchial relaxation, that's when we do a lot of albuterol, ipotropium, the duoneb to get that maximum benefit. They may have some localized effects, but most of these are tolerated fairly well and definitely may be maintenance drugs in some of our COPD patients. Our mainstay for rescue treatment is going to be a beta agonist or one of our adrenergics. Most people we think about our albuterol or the leave albuterol. There's some evidence that leave albuterol might have less of a beta-1 effect than we see with albuterol. We also have our long-acting agents. It's important to consider those long-acting agents are maintenance therapy only. But if I stimulate beta-1, I get the tachycardia. I get some of the tremors. If I stimulate beta-2, which is our goal here, is I get the bronchial relaxation. It also tends to have a little anti-inflammatory property. But we have beta-2 receptors in other places, the skeletal muscles. That's why sometimes we get that anxiety and we get those tremors and the jitteriness that we'll sometimes get after they've had three or four albuterol treatments. Or some of my patients say they're albuterol. But these adrenergics or these beta agonists are really going to have significant benefits. It binds with those beta 2 receptors. It gives a smooth muscle relaxation. It's going to help decrease that airway narrowing we see in the bronchial tree. Helps improve things like tidal volume, vital capacity. They also have that benefit of inhibiting mast cells, stabilizing mast cells. Epinephrine is really good at that. That's why it's sometimes our second line agent. What are mast cells? What do they do? Why is that so important? Mast cells are what degranulate and release histamine. So if I can slow or stop the release of histamine, then I'm going to have less immunological response and help me slow down the mucus production the vasodilation, the bronchial constriction. So we talked about albuterol some. Epi is a phenomenal beta agonist. Usually it's not our first line agent for respiratory patients, but definitely should be considered when people are refractory to albuterol. Epi's downside is it gives us both beta and alpha effects. It's gonna give us equal beta one and beta two. So I'm gonna get more of the tachycardia, more of the tachyarrhythmia concerns but definitely it's a very potent beta-2 agonist and the patient who's had multiple albuterol treatments and they're not better, we need to think about epinephrine. Epi-IM is a good option. We may even nebulize it in some patients give it right at the site. Very rare, we may go to IV epi. Keep in mind your concentrations, the one to 1,000, which is one in one, that is your IM or your nebulized epi. The one in 10,000 or one in 10, that's your IV formulation, that's your cardiac epi. Rarely we have to go that route, but sometimes we do. But definitely we're giving IM epi 0.3 for adults or nebulizing some, that's gonna be your one in one. And my understanding is starting in 2020, all new boxes will be labeled one in 10 or one in one. So not to confuse people, because some people get confused with the one in 1,000 and the one in 10,000. But it just has to do with the concentration. Primatine mist that used to be available, that was epinephrine. And actually, I understand it's coming back. It either just came back out or it's fixing to be back out because they got a new formulation for the propellant. But primatine mist that people used to use for their, for their asthma was just epinephrine. So we think about patients that have severe asthma. We get into this, we talk about allergic reactions. But do those people have access to an epinephrine auto injector? They should. 
because definitely if they have acute asthma exacerbation, they're getting no better with their inhaled beta agonist, they should have access to an epinephrine auto-injector or at least epinephrine they can draw up and administer because these auto injectors can be kind of expensive. And there's lots of stuff from medical and political sides about these, but patients should have access to them because if they're truly having a severe asthma exacerbation, not getting better, this may be the differentiating factor between collapse and resuscitation. Racemic epi, one of our other agencies available. Racemic epi is one of those isomers of epinephrine. If you talk about chemically, we split it in half, and we take half of it, and that's our racemic. Racemic is thought to be a little lighter, so it's only half of the epi molecule, so it stays in the upper airways a little bit better. That's why it's usually our drug of choice for treating croup. Strider. As an adrenergic, it's going to cause some vasoconstriction. That's going to reduce airway edema and hopefully improve airflow and gas exchange. Typically, think about patients that we're giving racemic to, probably should be monitored for two to four hours after to see if they have a return of their symptomology. It may be that the drug wears off, it may be just a rebound effect, or it may not really matter. It depends on what literature you read. But if I'm giving that patient a racemic treatment, I'm going to watch them for a couple hours, make sure they're not having a return of their symptoms. If their symptoms return, that patient may need to be more treated or even admitted for observation of other treatment. But if they're resolved, it's been four hours, their strider's gone, they can probably go home. We should not use racemic if we think they have epiglottitis, only for croup. Asmorenephrine that's available over the counter now that took the place of, of uh, promethine mist, that's actually racemic epi. And so you may encounter people that are taking um, this for their asthma treatment. It's probably not as effective as other beta agonists because it doesn't get deep penetration in the brachial tree. So as I talked about earlier, the SABAs, your short-acting beta agonist, your albuterol, your leave albuterol, even your epi or your tributylene, those are your rescue drugs. And it's very important that our patients understand that if they're having an acute attack at home, it's their albuterol. It's their leave albuterol. It's not their Advair, not their Cerevent they need to be taking. These short-acting drugs, the rescue drugs, are what need to be used during an acute attack. The goal is with asthma, if they're well-maintained, then they don't have to use their albuterol, but maybe once or twice a week. But if you're talking to your patient and ask them, how long does an albuterol inhaler last them? If that albuterol inhaler does not last at least three months, that patient is not well controlled. If they're having to use their albuterol so much that they don't get more than three months out of it, they're not controlled. That necessarily doesn't fall to us as emergency providers, but lets you know how uncontrolled their asthma is. These have definitely changed over the couple of years because of changes in the propellant to make them a little bit more expensive but definitely patients with asthma should have access to a SABA. Maybe we need to do that through the EED so we can do proper inhaler education with a spacer, but they definitely need to have access to that inhaler. As I mentioned earlier, leave albuterol, which is Zopinex, might be a little less beta-1 effective than albuterol, so we might have less tacky effects or less palpitations with it. Some people are a little sensitive and this drug may be appropriate for them, but for most people, albuterol is just as effective and a lot less expensive. But if that's the patient that really is beta sus um, susceptible and they get a lot of tacky effect from that, then it may be a favorite to go to leave albuterol. Our long-acting agents, as I mentioned, these are the maintenance drugs. Anybody who has persistent asthma should be on some type of maintenance drug. First line usually is inhaled corticosteroid, next is the LABA, a long-acting beta agonist. Most of these are gonna last 12 to 24 hours, some are twice a day, some are once a day. There's a huge black box warning on the LABAs that we know that if they're not used with an inhaled corticosteroid, they do increase mortality. Asthmatics need to be on inhaled corticosteroid. COPD patients, not as appropriate, but definitely doesn't hurt. But we know if a patient with asthma is on a LABA without an ICS, that may increase their mortality rate. Part of it may come just from education, but part of it's the disease process. They need that anti-inflammatory. They need that inhaled corticosteroid.
So hit a lot of these already, but adverse effects we have to think about with all these beta agonists, the tachycardias, the muscle spasms or shakiness, jitteriness. Those are all things we have to think about. If they're doing large doses, we may get some hypokalemia or some hypomagnesemia from it. That patient has had a four hour neb, well, that might be a concern. We can sometimes see these paradoxical bronchospasms that happen from overuse. If this patient has wore out their inhaler in the last hour at home, they may get worsening bronchospasms just from overuse so close and so rapidly. There is some concern for tolerance over time. So if they've been using this for 20, 30 years, they may have less effect. If your patient's on a non-selective beta blocker, especially like propranolol, that may inhibit the effect of a beta-2 agonist like albuterol or leave albuterol. So just keep that in mind. If they're taking propranolol, one of those other non-selected beta blockers, that may inhibit your therapy. It may be worth reversing them or considering a reversal. We'll talk about that a little bit more later in tox. But that was the medication reconciliation is really important because some of our great drugs work against each other when we're trying to treat exacerbations. So just kind of a table just to kind of compare some of this stuff for us. We've got our short actings, we've got our long actings, we've got our anticholinergics. Most things patients now, especially asthma, are going to be on a fixed combination. They should always be on an inhaled corticosteroid and maybe a LABA. Our mexylxanthines like theophylline, rarely used nowadays, but definitely if you encounter the patient who's on theophylline, that's severe asthma or that's severe COPD. There is some benefit with those severe stages that theophylline actually may improve diaphragmatic contractions and give a little bit better volume for those patients, but it has a lot of interactions. It has a very narrow therapeutic range. But definitely if you can count the patient who's on theophylline, that's severe asthma or severe COPD. But hopefully for asthma, they're at least on an ICS. For COPD, they're on some type of short-acting or long-acting anticholinergic and probably a LABA as well. ICS, not as helpful in COPD, but still plays a role. My asthma. They said they'd fix it, but it didn't make any difference at all. Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? You can't make some stuff up. So somebody failed education there. I don't know if it was us or her, but I think she answered her own question. But definitely using their inhalers properly is really important. And some people have trouble with psychomotor skills but using that inhaler very appropriately is really important. So magnesium. Magnesium is a smooth muscle relaxer. We use it for multiple things, but definitely with an asthma exacerbation that's not getting better with albuterol or leave albuterol, they've got refractory asthma, a dose of magnesium usually is effective. Probably for most adults, it's two grams IV over 10, 15 minutes, but it's a smooth muscle relaxer. It's gonna relax those smooth muscles hopefully improve airflow, reduce bronchial constriction. If it's given too rapidly, it can cause some flushing, can cause some weird side effects that people don't like. But usually two grams is not as big of a concern when we're talking about treating OB problems when they're getting four and six grams. But definitely that patient who's refractory, consider giving them two grams of IV mag. It can be very beneficial. Corticosteroids. Definitely with asthma exacerbations, we need to consider systemic corticosteroids. We try to avoid those because of systemic problems, but definitely giving those corticosteroids are gonna help prevent mast cell activation, help reduce the inflammatory response, because we start activating all those cytokines and leukotrienes. The downside of corticosteroids is they don't work instantaneously. They can take four to six hours to start having an effect, and those systemic effects can be problematic immune suppression, hyperglycemia, and lots of other problems. But definitely, if that patient's having refractory asthma, 
they're having an exacerbation that definitely either systemic or inhaled corticosteroids definitely should be considered. And most literature is really pointing now towards inhaled corticosteroids in the ED. We may use these in COPD as well, again, to suppress the immune response. We use them also in allergic reactions, again, to suppress the immune response. But their effect is not instantaneous. It may take several hours for that benefit to be there. So given in that single dose, may be more effective than doing a long-term therapy. As I mentioned, let's think about using inhaled corticosteroids there in the ED. If you've got things like budesimide, we can nebulize that with their albuterol. If not, using inhaled corticosteroid with a meter dose inhaler is going to be as effective. But definitely they're having refractory, it may be beneficial to send them home on a couple day dose of oral steroids. If it's less than seven days, a taper is not needed, and easy just to give them a three to five day course, that's probably it. Especially if they have repeated history of exacerbations, that may be beneficial. But if you're looking at the patient, they've got asthma, and they're not only held corticosteroid, that's something I would consider prescribing and making sure they have follow-up. I may only give them one, but that definitely is going to play a significant role in reducing their exacerbations and hopefully improving their quality of life as well. So this table just kind of give you an idea about potency and looking at these. Many different types of corticosteroids out there, some injectable, some oral. Some have a little bit stronger effect than others. Betamethasone, dexamethasone, prednisolone, prednisone, your choice, your flavor. But some are more effective than others. Some are going to be longer acting. But some are also going to have a little bit more complications like sodium retention. Hydrocortisone is really good at that. Hydrocortisone is the most like cortisol. It has both glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid properties. All the other ones are purely glucocorticoids. They're purely going to have that inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect. Probably most of these patients we allude to probably should be discharged home on at least a short course or at least start on inhaled corticosteroid if not. Some of these come as combinations. Some of these may just be purely steroids, but definitely someone who has persistent asthma, more than mild persistent asthma, should be on an inhaled corticosteroid probably with a lab of at least an inhaled corticosteroid. Definitely these long-acting agents are very beneficial for maintenance, but it's really important that we make sure the patient understand the difference between their LABA and their LAMA and their short-acting agents. That during that acute attack, if they take their long-acting agent, it may not have an effect for about two hours. And during that acute exacerbation, they need that albuterol, or they need that ipotropium in the COPD patient. Lots of combinations out there. Some are approved for COPD. Some may have implications for asthma as well. But definitely it's important the patient understand, and we need to get them in to see somebody, if possible, to control this more than we can do in the ED. The inhaled corticosteroid side effects usually are localized, dryness in the mouth. Patients after they use an inhaled corticosteroid should rinse and spit. Most inhaled corticosteroid ends up in the mouth and in the GI tract. In the GI tract, the concern is pretty mine, but in the mouth, they definitely get oral candidal infection, so we recommend they rinse after that, and they get the biggest benefit for those. With prolonged use, they might develop some of those steroid-induced problems like the hyperglycemia, Definitely, if we're doing systemic corticosteroids, that's a big concern. And after about 7 to 10 days of systemic corticosteroids, we have to worry about suppression of the HPA axis. That's the patient now that they've been on steroids for two weeks. That patient really needs to taper down versus they were on a five-day course, not a big concern. Usually, it takes 7 to 10 days to start having that suppression of the adrenal glands. But if that patient's been on corticosteroids for years, they have to taper down. And sometimes that can take a year to fully taper off corticosteroids. After about seven to 10 days, your adrenal glands stop producing any corticosteroids. And it's gonna take a while for your adrenal glands to get back into business. Otherwise, they can have significant Addisonian crisis type presentation and go into severe withdrawals. Just a quick little bit about the myoclonal antibodies. Most of us are not prescribing these. But we definitely can see patients that are on these. And definitely they have severe persistent asthma. These drugs have been very effective at suppressing that immune response. They see an allergist, they get tested, and they look at using these. And these are purely immune globulin monoclonal antibodies. And they're very effective at controlling severe asthma. 
but these also, since they're immunological properties, can trigger anaphylaxis. Uh, definitely I've encountered patients who come in, they were at the office, they got their dose, and they developed some anaphylaxis-like symptoms and came to the ED. Typical treatment is still going to be your IM epinephrine, your corticosteroids, your beta agonists if they need them. But these drugs are very effective, but if you see people taking one of these MABs, they have severe asthma. And this definitely hopefully has improved their symptoms and hopefully shortened the duration of their exacerbations when they have them, but they definitely can cause some significant reactions. Just to kind of refresh you, here's the stepwise approach for asthma. I made a couple uh, references to mild versus moderate versus severe. This table just kind of gives you an idea of where your patients are at. How often they have in symptomology? How often they have to use their rescue inhaler? How severe their symptoms are? Really just kind of gives you an idea of where this patient at is in their trajectory of their disease course. And this is the stepwise approach to where should they be? Step one versus step Six, big difference there. But if you're looking at your patient and they fit that severe asthma and they're only like on step two, this kind of tells you this patient's not well controlled. And not that it's going to fall to us to manage, but making sure they understand the importance of getting in to see somebody or maybe communicating with whoever their, their manager is that, hey, their asthma is getting worse and I want them to follow back up with you and whatever the time frame will be. But it kind of gives you an idea. So if you look at this patient, they're on a high dose ICS with a, with a LABA and they may be taking other things, that patient's got moderate severe asthma. Here's the stage guidelines for COPD based on the gold guidelines, kind of just give you some of the diagnostic criteria for what differentiates moderate versus severe, looking at their FEV1, and kind of give you an idea of where those patients should be. And if this patient's on a long-acting agent plus an inhaled corticosteroid, they probably have moderate to severe COPD. And then lastly are antihistamines. Our first generation antihistamines, most of these are available over the counter. They're great for rhinitis, they're great for congestion, itching, but most of your first generation antihistamines cross the blood-brain barrier and they cause drowsiness. That's why diphenhydramines uses the key ingredient in most over-the-counter sleep aids. Your second generation drugs, which some are available over the counter, some are prescription, those tend not to cross the blood-brain barrier and probably are as effective as first generation at treating things like allergic rhinitis or urticaria. So probably for most people, we'd rather recommend they take something like phenofexine or loratadine for their, asthma, uh, for their allergy symptoms versus a first generation because of that risk of drowsiness. If one agent isn't effective, they can try another one. They all work similarly, but have some little different sites, and it may be that phenofexine doesn't work very well so sertralzine might be more effective for that person. But these are all going to help reduce capillary permeability, therefore reduce the production of mucus and air with edema. As much as we hate it, all that snot, all that edema is protective, and our goal here is to reduce that ability so that we don't have all that symptomology that goes along with it. Tolerance can develop over time, so that person who takes diphenhydramine every night to sleep, eventually they're going to notice it's not as effective as it used to be. And definitely they're taking sertralzine every day. They may lose some of that benefit over time, and that's why sometimes rotational therapy may be helpful in some of those patients. But probably for your allergic rhinitis patient, a second-generation antihistamine is usually our first-line agent. Any questions about our respiratory drugs? Definitely think about the patient who we've given albuterol to, they've had three or four nebs. If it's not working, let's go to something else. Epi and magnesium should be in your forefront. Even if that's an older patient who has CAD history, I might give them a lower dose, but if they're refractory to albuterol, they need something else. You can try the mag. If not, I may try 0.1 milligrams of IM epi versus the 0.3 we give for most people and see, but if they're having severe asthma exacerbations, that epi may be very beneficial in opening those airways and reducing their complications. We really try to avoid intubation in those patients if possible. We use a lot of non-invasive. We get to the CNS lecture, I'll talk some about ketamine, but ketamine is a really good drug for RSI or for supporting non-invasive because it also affects catecholamines and may help with bronchial relaxation as well.